Welcome to Beyond Your Why podcast, where we go beyond just talking about your why and actually help you discover and then live your why. You see, we believe that knowing your why, that driving force behind every decision you make and every action you take is the essential first step to really knowing yourself. It allows you to move forward faster and have a bigger impact. If you're already a fan of the show, then you know that every week we talk about one of the nine whys, and then we introduce you to somebody with that why so you can see how their why has played out in their life. This show will be more powerful for you if you've already discovered your why. If you still need to do that, head over to whyinstitute.com and discover your why today. It'll only take you about five minutes. Now let's meet today's guest. This week, we're going to be talking about the why of contribute, to contribute to a greater cause, add value, have an impact in the lives of others. So if this is your why, then you want to be part of a greater cause, something that's bigger than yourself. You don't necessarily have to be the face of the cause, but you want to contribute in a meaningful way. You love to support others and you relish successes that contribute to the greater good of the team. You see group victories as personal victories. You're often behind the scenes looking for ways to make the world better. You make a reliable and committed teammate, and you often act as the glue that holds everyone else together. You use your time, money, energy, resources, and connections to add value to other people and organizations. And so today, I have a great guest for you. His name is Stefan Spencer. He is an SEO expert, founder of interactive agency Net Concepts. He's a best-selling author, serial entrepreneur, life hacker, podcaster, and contributor to Harvard Business Review and Ad Weekly. He has three books published by O'Reilly, The Art of SEO, out in his fourth edition, Social E-Commerce, and Google Power Search. He's helped optimize websites from some of the biggest brands in the world, including Chanel, Volvo, Sony, Zappos. Stefan hosts two podcast shows, Get Yourself Optimized, and Marketing Speak. Stefan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Gary. It's great to be here. Well, this is going to be fun. I, now, tell everybody where you are right now. I'm in Tel Aviv, Israel. Been here for about a month. And just as a quick aside, like, what's it like over there compared to what we hear here in the U.S.? Is what we hear what you're experiencing? No, it's uh, the CNN Crisis News Network. <laughs> is all about selling fear for eyeballs and, and advertising. And I don't watch the news. I don't watch TV. So this is not uh, helpful. doesn't feed my soul. And what I experience on a daily basis when I go to the park, when I go to the playground with my son, and I go uh, to the grocery store, whatever, is, um, is peace and, and, and regular life. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not like... I can't imagine it's what we hear over here. So um, thanks for that, the, the quick update. But let's go back. Let's let our listeners get to know you, Stefan. Where were you born? What were you like growing up? Okay. Well, uh, growing up was, was quite a challenge for me because I was bounced around a lot as a kid. I ended up in foster care eventually. But before that, I was living with my grandparents. Uh, my mother was not capable of raising me. So as a, as a baby, my grandmother came over and said, this is not good. I need to take him. And, and uh, yeah, I started living with my grandparents after that. And uh, when she died in, when I was in fourth grade, I, uh, it was a pretty tumultuous time for me. I ended up going to live with my aunt for a couple of years. We went to Connecticut and then Florida. And then I got bounced back to Toledo to live with my grandfather because my aunt got a divorce. It was really chaotic. And my grandfather was really abusive, violent. It was, it was a very tough childhood. And uh, it was a very bad neighborhood that my grandparents lived in. So it was very unsafe. I almost got abducted as a little kid just going around the block once. Um, yeah, so that was quite a, a, quite a challenging uh, childhood. Of course, it's all perfect yeah. because it's all by design, you know? And so looking back, you can connect the dots, but you can't connect those dots as you're going through it. 
doesn't it doesn't make sense. I mean, sometimes you can get a little glimpse of insight from the creator, but other times it's just like, how does this chaos really work, and how does this even make sense? So, wow, it, it was it was a gift. In retrospect, I see it now, but um, my wife says, you know, sometimes the gift has the bow on the bottom. So I didn't see it as a gift at the time. I just saw it as a as a completely chaotic. Um, you know, in, in, in Hebrew, the word is belagon. <laughs> so it's just a mess. It's an absolute mess. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it, it was, it certainly strengthened my resilience. I did really well in school. So that was a, a way for me to gain some, uh, reassurance that everything was going to be okay. Cause I did really well in school. I got great scholarships when I went to college and everything. And, uh, it just, uh, it helped to, uh, yeah, build my resiliency. I, I say that I'm not even just resilient. I'm anti-fragile because I grew and evolved from the chaos, not just bounce back from it. There's a big difference, you know, so that's that's how I see my, my child. Yeah. If we were to have seen you in high school, what would we have seen? A uh, really smart kid who... Uh, didn't just run with a particular pack. I kind of fit in wherever I, I was um, uh, just adaptive. I, I adapted to different environments and uh, I, I wasn't a jock, but I did well in, in school in the, in, in sports like track and cross country. I actually helped set a school record. This is with thousands of kids. There were several thousand kids in the school. And uh, I set a, a, a record uh, when in the uh, four by eight hundred relay, so I ran two minutes and six seconds, eight hundred meters. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, a couple other of the team members actually ran faster than that, so the collective time of the four of us beat the school record of decades. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's awesome. So you you were not. I mean, you had a couple sports that you were into. What other kinds of things were you into? Oh, I loved playing with the computer. It got so bad, though, in terms of me being overly into the computer that, and I taught myself not just basic, but assembly language. Like, I could code in hexadecimal. (laughs) So, uh, an uber geek. And I wrote my own bulletin board system, a BBS, back in the day before uh people were on the internet uh there were bbs's that you would dial into and i did the uh the the i I was a a sysop systems operator of a bbs that i wrote myself i wrote the whole code in in basic uh and uh, ran it on my home phone line and so at the time i was living with my mom and uh i was for a short period of time maybe a year but uh, yeah, I'd tie up her home phone line uh, most of the time. People calling in and and, and using the uh, uh, the BBS. So that got to a point where I knew this was unhealthy because I was doing all nighters during the summer coding <laughs> as a thirteen year old. Just didn't feel right. But I I I needed to do something because my mother actually worked third shift and I was home alone all night long as a thirteen year old. Not great, right? So I had to do something to feel safe. So I stayed up all night and I coded. And then it got to the point where this was not a good thing for me. I recognized that this was way over the top. <clears throat> so I sold my computer, gave away all my software, and went cold turkey. No more computer. And then joined the track team, cross-country team, cycling club, and uh, went to that other extreme (laughs) so whatever you get into you really get into it yeah okay all right so now you graduate high school off to college where did you go to college university of michigan okay it's unfortunate since i went to usc but uh i actually went to usc as well but i hated it so I <laughs> I dropped out after one semester, went back to University of Michigan. Yeah. That's oh my gosh. Okay. 
Yeah, small world. And so yeah. what I did was one semester at University of Michigan? I'm like, oh, I want to do the California dream thing. And then I moved out to to California, went to USC, and I thought, wow, these these uh, instructors, the TAs, and the and and the professors weren't nearly as good as the ones at University of Michigan. I really need to go back, and I did. Okay, so you go back to Michigan, and then you, uh, what did you major in? Cellular and molecular biology. And by the way, this probably will throw people off too, is I met the lady who became my wife in California while I did that short stint at USC, and it was the summer before I started uh, at USC. And then I decided, uh, as I said, to go back to University of Michigan. I convinced my... uh, who she became my wife actually that same year. So I got married at 19. So we're married and we moved back or we, we moved to Ann Arbor. She'd never spent any time there. So she, that was a big, uh, uh, you know, leap of faith for her to, to do that. But we, uh, we did that and yeah, uh, I was married 18 years. So that, that, um, didn't end up lasting that, that uh, yeah, and it came to a, a close that relationship. But I have three daughters and a stepdaughter from that relationship. So I was very busy being a uh, father to really young kids while going to school, two of them in diapers, and I'm going to University of Michigan. And my wife at the time is studying for a master's at Eastern Michigan University. So it was, and and we had a four or five year old, <laughs> a, a stepdaughter for me. It was a lot. It was it was uh, heavy duty. Yeah, with a little bit of work, you could maybe overcomplicate that a bit, huh? Yeah, Jeez. you know, if I if I could figure out a way, I would have. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. So okay, you're you're in uh, University of Michigan. Cellular molecular biology. Why cellular and molecular biology? I wanted to cure cancer. I wanted to like do something that changed the world. Ah. Uh, and then how did that go for you? Uh, well, everything's perfect in retrospect, but I found that when I went to uh, my, my uh, master's program, <laughs> I actually entered a PhD program. Uh, so this was after University of Michigan. I went to University of Wisconsin Madison, and uh, in the biochemistry department, studying for a PhD, I had a run-in with my advisor, who wanted me at the bench much more because hey, the other graduate students, they're here almost twenty-four-seven. You go home at six o'clock. Like, what do you? Th- who do you think you are? And it's like I've got young kids at home. I I have to be home. I can't just be here all evening long. And uh, he's like, at some, at some point, he basically said, get out. Like, you, you, you're done here. Uh, this is not how we play ball. And uh, I, I said, okay, because I didn't want to start over again. And I didn't want to um, a- even pursue that career path anymore, be a postdoc after that, professorship, fighting for tenure. That's just... For what? A, a maybe six-figure income? It, it seemed like a joke to me. So it, it uh, yeah, I was very disillusioned <laughs> by, all, by all that. And, and at the same time, this beautiful, amazing uh, synchronicity happened where I ended up getting into a conference. This was 1994. So this was very early days of the, of the web, very early, right? So the World Wide Web had just been invented in the last couple of years. Mosaic, the browser from NCSA at the uh, University of Indiana, that just recently came out within the last year or so. Yeah, so I just created did. a website for my department uh, or for the Institute of Molecular Virology while I was at the university. And so that gave me an opportunity to do some cutting edge stuff in the very early days of the web when there weren't that many websites out there. And I put these visualizations of 3D, like 3D spinning virus structures and stuff. <laughs> and and uh, I ended up getting into a conference 
to present a paper about this. It was called the Second International World Wide Web Conference. And Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, was the keynote speaker. And in uh, the breakout, or what was it? It was like the speaker lounge, I think. I had just had a conversation with this guy named Rob McCool. And you probably don't know who Rob McCool is. Pretty badass sounding name though, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a great name. You probably have heard of the software he created though, Apache. Oh yeah. Runs most websites on the internet, uh, that and Nginx. So he created Apache, but before he created Apache, he created the NCSA HTTPD server. So the web server that was the server component to the Mosaic browser he wrote the server. So he was working with Mark uh, Andreessen building Netscape together. Mm -hmm. And he was just there as one of the speakers. And I had never heard of him. And I never, I, like, I was a little bit starstruck <laughs> him telling me the story of, like, he actually wrote the HTTPD uh, app or, or server software that ran the web server's that um, NCSA had created the, the server and the browser. Everyone knew about the browser, but n n not many people realized that the server was just as important, and he wrote the server, and then he got poached by Mark to go found this company together, Netscape. So he wrote the Netscape server, Mark wrote the browser, so I was just enamored by all of this, having this conversation with this guy. And I'm like, why am I taking this track to be a postdoc and then a professor and all this nonsense? At the same time, I was having this run in with my my advisor, you know, the one who was in charge of my uh, education and, and w had to say whether I get to finish or not. So I'm like, yeah, this is not for me. I, I, I need to be doing this stuff and not the thing that I thought I, I was destined for. So that took me on a completely different trajectory, the one that I was meant to be on, actually, now that I see it in retrospect, because I've been in this uh, online marketing world and, and, and SEO in particular, but just all of the web stuff happened because I just, by circumstances, divinely orchestrated ones end up at that particular conference and then got this amazing conversation that inspired me to to really go full into the the website so did you then go back to university of michigan and decide to stop that path right then and then switch no, directions no, or did it take I, I i stopped with the so the advisor I uh, was working in his lab. He let me finish another few months to get a master's degree. So I have a master's in biochemistry, uh, which I do absolutely nothing with and have <laughs> had done nothing with. But uh, at least I finished that, I have some closure to it. And then I started uh, my, my company, my web agency in Madison, Wisconsin, and then um, ran that for Quite a number of years until eventually uh, I had had a successful exit. So the company got acquired in 2010, and <clears throat> I started a, another company in 2010 after my earnout. So as soon as the check cleared, <laughs> I'm like I'm out of here. And then uh, yeah, I've been running that company for 14 years. And w so the first company was called what? So the first company actually was called Internet Concepts, and then it, we changed the brand to Net Concepts, and then the company got acquired, the assets, the customers, all that sort of stuff, but they didn't care about the brand. So the brand sat, sat dormant. They canceled the trademark, and they had no interest in, in using Net Concepts. They gave me the netconcepts.com domain, and then... Ten years later, I realized, like, wait, wait a second, why am I not using that brand again? So, 2020, I decide let's re revitalize and and uh, re reestablish the Net Concepts brand. Prior to that, I was just operating under my own personal brand, Stuff and Spencer, 
but that really limits me in terms of my ability to service uh, the, the companies as an agency. I look like a small, you know, independent expert, kind of a solopreneur, but I'm not. I've got a, a team and we do, you know, pretty big projects. I've got, you know, a dozen or a, and a half folks who are working on content creation and link building and technical SEO and auditing and, and all that. And yeah, that's not me. That's my team. So that's why yeah. I started using NetConcepts again. I just dusted off the uh, netconcepts.com domain that was gathering uh, dust and, and sitting in mothballs and then whoop, new website. <laughs> so what's what was the path from net concepts to what you're currently doing? How are they different? Yeah, so... Uh, boy, that's a big question because there's this whole thing that happened in the process that totally awakened me to my bigger why, my my mission, my soul's mission. And uh, two big events that occurred after I sold my company, the, the, that first exit in 2010, what happened was <clears throat> I was at a... Uh, a Tony Robbins event, I joined their Platinum Partnership, and this was uh, uh, yeah, October of 2012. We're in India. The Platinum Partners, they pay like an insane amount of money to be in kind of this inner circle group of, uh, uh, of people going to exclusive events of Tony Robbins. So we're in India. Tony has arranged for these monks to come in from uh, you know, like they're 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 called oneness monks, and one of them zapped me on the head with this like a, a a blessing. And it sounds weird, but it was like a psychedelic experience. I was agnostic my whole life. Remember, my, I was raised by partially by my grandparents, and they were at war all the time with each other. One was a Jehovah's Witness, and the other was a converted Catholic. And they just didn't see eye to eye on anything. So I thought, this is all bunk. None of this is real. It's all you know, like made up. So I was agnostic. Up until age 42, I'm in India. One of the monks gives me a, a blessing, uses his hands, touches my head. And I have this psychedelic trip. I, I've, I've, I have no other way to describe it. Like, it was as if I had taken LSD or something. I've never take, I've never even smoked a cigarette. <laughs> so this was very unusual, like uh, foreign to me, but everything was in technicolor like a cartoon. It was incredible. And I felt this mm. deep sense of peace and connection and oneness. I felt like everything was perfect and it was all like the the... Archi architected it was all uh for for us it was beautiful it was amazing it's like i could go outside and see the energy of the plants and the trees and everything so that that was my first big experience and then two months later i'm at a tony robbins uh date with destiny event and i meet my now wife uh, after I prayed for her that morning to show up in my life, I wrote up a relationship vision and everything. Part of the exercises for that event is to write a relationship vision. I wasn't in a relationship. I had gone two and a half years without a single date. And then I was started dating and I just, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, I, I felt the void <laughs> there for sure. So I'm praying really hard knowing that uh, God's hearing my prayer because of my experience in India two months earlier. And uh, 12 hours later, we, we, we meet. We're introduced by a mutual friend. And I knew within 10 minutes that she was my soulmate, Ten, maybe five minutes. And the reason why is because I did that, that oneness blessing on her. Because everyone in the event on the last day gets a blessing, but it's kind of chaotic and unstructured. Some people get blessed twice and some people don't get blessed at all. And she didn't get touched. Like, oh, I, I, I learned how to do that in India. Like, you want me to do it for you? And wow, when I blessed her, I was praying for her like she was my soulmate. And I knew, I knew she was my soulmate. 
Wow. Nine days later, I proposed to her in a hot air balloon, and uh, oh, and she says no. <laughs> so she says no. She says not yet because it's been nine days. I mean, that's just sounds crazy, right? <laughs> nine days. Yeah, yeah. And I had the ring and everything. I was, uh, yeah, because I knew. But nine months later, when I reproposed, she said yes. I mean, obviously, it worked out because we're married and we have an almost five-year-old. <laughs> wow. You know, and if you're not in this space, if you weren't at the event and you haven't been to the different things that you've been on, you may not make a lot of sense. But being in the space that you were, I'm sure it would just seem like, well, this is, of course, this is the way it's going to go. Yeah. And and it did. Yeah. And so that that's that's exciting. And... um so the the psychedelic trip that you were talking about made you think differently about God. Yes. I, it established, it reestablished my personal connection to him. And I felt like mm. I mattered. I'm cared for. There's a bigger picture. This isn't all chaos for no reason. We don't live in a malevolent, malevolent universe. We live in a benevolent one. Because I, I that had to be an amazing so much like... of the negative news, so much uh, tragedy and chaos through you know growing up and just the news and uh, just life, and I started to buy into the lie, the fear-based narrative, and I thought, yeah, this is a this is not a friendly universe. I didn't I didn't think, you know, but I I I had been deceived. I mean, we're all being deceived if we don't believe that this is all for best good and that this is by design uh, meant for our soul's um, refinement. Yeah. Mm. So you meet your future wife at a Date with Destiny event. You propose nine days later and end up, you know, reproposing nine years later. Now, how the heck? Nine months you... later. Nine months. Sorry, nine months. Yeah, nine months later. <laughs> and so, what she could tolerate? I mean, she was starting yeah. to get nervous after about six months because she looked up the uh, the the reproposal rate is incredibly low. Incredibly low. If you look at the stats, it, it's not encouraging. So she was starting to get a, a little nervous there about six months into it. <laughs> oh my gosh! But I got a so, whole new ring and everything, and and. Uh, uh, where I had um, met her, actually, so I had met her at that date with Destiny event in in uh, Desert Spring or uh, Palm Desert in in uh, you know the uh, Palm Springs area. Yep, I arranged for us to be at that same hotel from <laughs> the JW Marriott, uh, staying there for a weekend, and also I arranged to. Uh, I, I had a tripod and everything, and I videoed it myself. And she had no idea. Like, there are three rules to a great proposal. One, she has no idea that you're, you're going to be proposing. Two, her nails are done. That's important. <laughs> and third is you capture it. You capture it on film, at least photos, if not video. And I'm, I got all three. <laughs> she had like on the way there. I'm like, I got a surprise for you. And I pull into a spa and she's like, what? Like a spa day or something? Not exactly. I got you a Manny Petty. And she's like, oh, okay, that's cool. Like she wanted the spa day when she saw where we were going. But then I got, got her like, she didn't connect the dots. Like, why, why am I getting a manicure? <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Great story. Okay, so then how the heck do you end up going from there to Israel? Yeah. So God asked me, and you might ask, like, how how does that work? Um, so I, first I have to tell you another uh, wild uh, story that happened. This was on January 22nd of 2021. We're in Israel for nine months at that point. Or at, at, at January, it was maybe five months into the nine months. So we're there in Israel, uh, actually in the same place that we're in right now when we're, we're recording. And I just spontaneously start praying in the middle of the night for a job. And you might wonder, what does, uh, what? 
So you're in Genius Network. I'm in Genius Network. <clears throat> One of our fellow Genius Network members is Sheila Gillette. Yep. Sheila and Marcus. Right, do you know them? Yep, very well. Yeah, they're amazing. So Sheila was on my podcast on Get Yourself Optimized, which is a personal development, not SEO podcast. So she's talking about spirituality, about psychic abilities and so forth. And then uh, towards the end of the conversation, um, Theo, the, the 12 archangels that she channels, came in and started sharing some amazing stuff too. Well, in preparation for that interview, I'd watched some videos of her and one was her uh, telling uh, the story of her near-death experience in 1969. She prayed for a job. She was on her deathbed, pulmonary embolism as a complication from childbirth, and she's praying for a job. Please, God, let me stay on the planet. Let me raise my kids. I'll do anything. Just give me a job. Please give me a job. Three months later, middle of the night, out of nowhere, I'm inspired. I start praying for a job. I have no idea what I'm asking for. <clears throat> Boom. I start praying for a job. And then uh, I, I'm shown the matrix, this whole illusion that we live in. And I can't, I can't um, uh, tell you, describe it to you because I couldn't hold on to it. It's like terabytes of data jammed into a eight gigabyte thumb drive. I couldn't hold it, but it changed me. It incredibly changed me and my perspective on everything. And then my psychic abilities came online. So now I'm this uber geek SEO guy with ability to channel and, uh, you know, clear audience, clairvoyance, uh, visions, uh, all, all that. Yeah. So maybe I've lost some people who are listening at this point and they're like, okay, <laughs> this is the part where I hit stop and they're <laughs> on the audio, but uh, you know, it's okay. I'm not for everybody. Nobody is like, if you, you, don't, if you're not willing to put yourself out there and speak your truth, if you're trying to please everybody, you end up pleasing nobody and you don't make any difference in the world. And as you know from my why, I'm here to make a difference. I'm here to contribute, to help people to connect to God, to reconnect to God, to, to return to God. And, uh, you know, all this stuff about business and everything, these these are all just, it's like playthings or, or, or like little distractions in comparison to the real why for being here in an incarnation on this planet. It's to cleave to God, to the creator, to the master of the universe, to find him in the darkness that he created. He created what seems like a void and he's in that void too. He's everywhere. There's not anything that is not of him or independent of him. So <clears throat> if you think about how uh, we have an opportunity to choose like this free will and then we get to go off the rails and find our way back on and get help and ask God for help and forgiveness and whatever. And this is just this beautiful video game we're playing. It's a beautiful movie and we're the star. Did you ever see this, the Truman Show? No. Oh, I need to uh, see it. Great movie. Jim Carrey. Uh, uh, don't read about it first. Just watch it. You yeah. love it. And then afterwards, this will make sense to you. You are Truman. When I say you, I mean you, Gary, because I'm talking to you, but I'm also talking to the listener. You, listener, are Truman. And that means that this whole world was created for you. The entire world was created for you so that you can serve God. And that that phrase is actually it's either in the bible or it's in the talmud or you know it's it's in a sacred work so the whole world created for you so that you can serve god and and i know this is a lot to take in but with that new perspective shift that i had on january 22nd of 2021 everything's different i mean everything the stuff that the, the stuff that i do on a daily basis the clients that i take on from the the side projects and and the 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 big projects I take on the memoir I'm working on uh, the the guests that I have on my podcast like everything has changed because I prayed for that job and I was given it. What was the job you were given? 
an ambassador of spirituality. Ambassador. So I can tell you for sure, Stefan, this is definitely not the direction that I thought our podcast was going to go. <laughs> As I was reading your bio and looking at all the different things that you've done, but I'm glad it did because this is is uh, where you're at right now and what's and and the journey that you've been on and it's and it's quite an amazing journey. Yeah. And so if you if you recall in the bio, there's the, I'm I'm name dropping in in the bio that I that <laughs> bio was written years ago. <laughs> that bio includes a lot of social proof and name brands and things like that. That was my ego. And so I haven't been focused on bringing on more of those kinds of clients. I'm focused now on bringing on clients who want to change the world, who want to reveal light in the world, who are a light in the world. And if they're not that kind of a, a, a company or person, then I don't work with them. Mm. Are you finding a lot of people in that space that are uh, you know, because there's a lot of people in Genius Network with us that that are, and there's plenty that aren't. But um, what are you finding as your, would you call it a rebranding or redirection or what would you call it for your business? It's more of a, <clears throat> oh, I guess, just a, a, a honing in on my ideal client and my ideal kinds of projects. So if you if you looked at the the big hero image message on the Net Concepts homepage, it's amplify your mission and message. It's not about take your company to the next level or you know uh, whatever result that you're after. If if this message of amplify your mission and message doesn't relate or doesn't resonate, we're not a fit. And that's okay because I'm not here for everybody. Yeah. So how do you help companies uh, amplify their mission and message? By thinking differently. By uh, coming up with- Hold on. Uh, hold on one second on that for just a second. For, for all of you- I like praise for you. Yeah. Yes, it is, because um, Stefan's YOS, okay, so his Y is to contribute to a greater cause, right? Add value, have an impact in, in other people's lives. How he does that is by thinking differently, challenging the status quo, doing it uh, unlike anybody else, not following a typical recipe. And then ultimately what he brings is a trusting relationship where others can count on him. And so I have a feeling that's what we're just about to hear. Oh, yeah. So- Let's talk about challenging the status quo, to be public about receiving messages from God. Most people, many people, I won't say most, but many people will say that's that's in the crazy bu bucket there. <laughs> like, I'm out. I'm out. And that's Who's okay. this nutcase? Yeah. Right? Because uh, we're all, he like I said, we're all here to cleave to God. And I'm sure there's some atheists listening, and that's okay. It's just that from when I was disconnected, I felt so alone. I, I wasn't, ag I was agnostic, not atheistic, but I, I was kind of close. And, and I didn't feel that purpose. I didn't feel uh, cared for and carried and, and looked after. I felt chaos. And now I know that was... Um, just a, a process, a, uh, a, a chapter in, in my book that I had to go through. And that's okay. In fact, it was perfect because it, it helped make me who I am now. It helped bring me to a lot of important realizations. When you have that contrast, then you can appreciate what you have. Without the rain and the snow and the inclement weather, how do you appreciate the sunshine? You need the contrast. So so those challenges have been a beautiful gift. But the, the thinking differently uh, outside the box and being willing to, to face and challenge that status quo, whatever the narrative is, and, and stand up against it and, and to help galvanize people, uh, create a movement 
so that we change the world in a meaningful way and and not fall into these traps of getting manipulated. This is uh, part of why I'm why I'm here. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's listening and they have a message or a mission that they want to bring to the world that will change it in a positive way, how do you go about helping them? So uh, in two ways. One is more on the kind of physical nuts and bolts, internet marketing, SEO, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I know my stuff. I mean, clearly, <laughs> this is a 770-page book here that I co-authored. I know a lot about how to get to the top of Google. I know a lot about other aspects of internet marketing, too, from um, email marketing and analytics and conversion and you know, just general web marketing, et cetera. But then there's this more metaphysical aspect that I bring into a business context or in, in, into a client um, uh, context. So I'm working with a client. I help that person connect with their intuition and and discern what is intuition and what is not when they're potentially going to get misled because not every intuitive hit that you get is legit. But if you listen to your intuition and you follow it, you get more intuition and you get more synchronicities and it keeps building. It's like a virtuous cycle. So on the metaphysical, if I teach a business owner how to use intuition in a business context. And it's like, I don't know, there's something there's something iffy or doesn't feel right about taking on this client. Ah, but we need the money. And I tell that person, don't take the client. Because your intuition told you no. Like, I, I hear you, Stefan, and, and I, I want to do that. But I'm in a place of fear and lack. I mean, they're they're not going to say that exactly, but that's basically what they're saying. You know, prettier, more uh, obfuscated wording. And then they take the client and it becomes the, 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 uh, a show. <laughs> I won't use the first yeah. word, but it it's a terrible, colossal mess. Maybe they go to court. Who knows? Maybe they stiffed the, my client a lot of money or whatever. But it's like, ah, I wish I would have listened to that intuition. Always trust right. your intuition uh, as, as well, I guess with discernment <laughs> because sometimes you can get fooled. So that's that's that thing of uh, the metaphysical. Uh, b- before we move on, how do you define intuition? Okay. So I forget where I uh, learned this from. I'm going to differentiate intuition from just like receiving. So intuition, also maybe known as the still small voice, it comes in unexpected. It's emotionally charged neutral. And it just stays there. Or if you have other thoughts, it just keeps popping right back in. It doesn't let go. A thought that doesn't let go. Yeah. So imagine, for example, that, uh, you you know, you just, you have a thought about, oh, I should ask stuff in this question. And then next thing, you know, we're talking about something else and that just disappears and it didn't come back. Okay. That wasn't your intuition telling you, you got to ask stuff in this question. If it just keep coming and coming and coming, or it just stays there and nothing else can go in there. Like, there are no other questions bubbling up. It's just that one. That one just keeps hammering on you. Ask stuff in that question. That's intuition. And especially if you feel no sense of excitement or anxiety or anything. It's just, this is it. You know, uh, one of my team, he was driving his family and uh, out of the blue, his wife in the passenger seat says, "Get in the left or no, get in the right lane." She says, "Get in the right lane." Out of the, out of nowhere, she just says this, and he's not reacting. She's staying in the left lane, and so she says it again: "Get in the right lane." This time louder. Took three times. Get in the right lane. As soon as he gets in the right lane, boom! There's an accident in the left lane. Right a second later. Right in front of them. That's intuition. Okay. 
Yeah, that happened last year. <laughs> wow. And you said contrast that with... Okay. When you're asking and you just want answers, it's not out of the blue. It's not get in the right lane or don't take this client. It's you trying to discern what the most benevolent outcome would be for a particular situation or a particular person or particular event. It's like, I need some answers. Please, God, uh, help me out here. <laughs> well, that's a different kind of receiving, and and you're in conversation with God. So some people say that praying is is talking and meditating is listening. So conversation with God, like there's actually a book called Conversations with God. And so if you're in conversation with God, you're also listening. How do you listen? Well, there are many ways of listening. One example of this is to simply put a question out there to God and say, like, is this going to lead to the most benevolent outcome to um, hire this particular person? And you just feel into whether it's a yes or a no. Like, so this is a superpower where you can basically look around corners. You get this weird feeling of a no, and it's like, this person is perfect on paper. I paid so much money to the recruiter to, to find this person. Ah, oh, it's not good. I just, I really need this person. And then you hire them, and then they embezzle from you, right? So whatever happens, right? It just is that seeing around corners, but you it didn't pop in out of nowhere. You asked. So that's an example of just a simple yes or no. Like you could try this right now. You could ask God, are you there? God, are you there? Like you could, you listener, you Gary could do it too. Right now, you could ask in your head without even speaking it aloud, God, are you there? There's no other answer but yes. So if you aren't hearing a yes, then you're just not tuned in. You haven't, you know, you, you haven't used that muscle enough. You might hear it in your own voice, in your inner inner hearing. And you might second guess that that's just me, that's my subconscious, or that's my oh, my own inner voice. That's not God. Everything is God. There's nothing that's not God. So if you got a yes, that you just cracked open the door to your own psychic abilities because we are all psychic. All of us, by design, that's a birthright. So if, if you want to play with this, then you can start asking more questions and then see how they show up. Do you get a visual? Do you hear it in your own voice, in your head? Do you get a feeling, a knowing? How does it show up? And then you start journaling. Every day I journal and I'm asking God, what do I need to know or do today? And I just quiet my mind and... I mean, you, you you ask God basically to quiet your mind because trying to control your own monkey mind is very hard on your own. So God, please just pop into my head what I need to work on. And you might just, something comes into your head and it fe doesn't feel like it came from anywhere. It's just like, oh yeah, that I, I, I promised my neighbor I would uh, mow his lawn for him a week ago and they haven't gotten around to it. It's funny, I just thought about it. I'm, I'm, this is hypothetical, but I just thought of that when I ask God, what do I need to know or do today? And boom, that comes into my consciousness. And I hadn't thought about it for a few days because I've been busy with stuff. Not a priority. I, he probably forgot about it. No, 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 no. <laughs> like these are the things that really do matter. Being true to your word, being of service, cleaning up the messes that you made, you know, somebody you told off uh, 10 years ago and there's this animosity and you, your pride is getting in the way. This is the good stuff. This is why we're here. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you help people do both parts of it. Get clear on what your intuition telling you and then let's use the tactics and the strategies and all the stuff that you've spent, you know, 25, 30 years learning to bring their help to help them amplify their their message or their um, mission. Yeah, that's right. Excellent, excellent. And um, and you're doing all that from Israel. Yeah. 
Did you ever think you would be living in Israel? Hmm. In 2020, yes, because we did have the intention of moving here back then, but it was really crazy uh, back in 2020 with the pandemic and the lockdowns and like the, it was pretty draconian, the measures. And so we eventually said, this is t too, too much. And we went to Florida, <laughs> which didn't have all the draconian measures. So uh, didn't think at the time that we decided to, to leave and then go to Florida that it would just be temporary that we would be coming back to Israel. So yeah, as I said, it was God asking me, and, and we have free will, so of course we can say no, but I'm not going to say no to God. So, and I, and I got multiple confirmations that this was uh, his will and his desire for me. And so many amazing miracles have happened since we've been here for a month. It's just it's beautiful. Okay. So take us through this. You asked the question, God says, move to Israel. You show up in Israel. Do you know anybody there? Do you, are you just like, how do you just no, show up in Israel? Israel? Hardly anybody. I know my mother-in-law and sister-in-law and oh, okay. a couple of business people who are um, weak ties that I haven't even let know that I'm in Israel yet. But yeah, n n no close friends or anything. But uh, miraculously, within a week, I meet somebody who feels like he's soul family. So I, I, uh, uh, I he, he is actually training me on martial arts. <laughs> and so I uh, just had a lesson this morning. He's amazing. And he told me, when I saw you, he, we met at a synagogue, and he said, when I saw you, I felt like I needed to help you, like I'm supposed to help you, like I'm here to help you, because he, 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 he's intuitive, you know? He, he doesn't have like the uh, clairaudience, clairvoyance, and all that sort of stuff that somebody like Sheila Gillette uh, has, but he just, he knew, he just knew that we were supposed to, like, he's supposed to help me. And he's been incredible, uh, an incredible help. Yeah. Wow. So last question. Um, well, I'm actually second to the last question. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given or maybe the best piece of advice you've ever given? Yeah. So one thing I learned uh, from a Kabbalah teacher some years ago was ask the question, why, why is this in my movie? So why do you ask the question, why is this in my movie? Well, you'll get, you, you, you'll have a better understanding and appreciation of this question after you see the Truman Show. But <clears throat> if you're the star of the movie, you're the observer in quantum physics, right? So the uh, observer effect, you actually change the outcome of things by observing it. Just seeing the thing changes the light from a wave to only a particle. It's both. It's a potentiality wave before you observe it, and it becomes a particle after and during it. So how does that work in spiritual uh, spiritual context? Well, me as the observer, I'm going through life, and I'm hearing, uh, and I'm witnessing, and I'm interacting, and all these things through with my daily life, and they're all for a purpose. Nothing is without purpose. <laughs> you hear in an apartment building nearby a family, so like a uh, a mother screaming and yelling, and 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 you know what is this? I'm, I don't know where it's coming from exactly. I can't help. Very angry, yelling, and so forth. Why? Why is this in my movie? And if you ask that question and you start to just ponder that and ask uh, God to help you with uh, ascertaining why that's in your movie, there could be all sorts of amazing insights that you get from that. Just having a a, a, a run in with somebody that uh, you know your landlord or whatever, and and you're like, why is this in my movie? Oh, because blah, 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 blah. And that just is uh, that reason you hadn't thought of, but it popped in your head when you had that question, when you posed that question. You know, I'm not saying everything that pops in your head is true. 
and to take it as absolute truth, but at least take it seriously. Journal this stuff. Like I have 1,300 pages in my Remarkable tablet in my in my God journal. This is, I'm writing gratitudes to God. I'm writing all the messages I receive. I'm writing all the challenges that I'm getting. And and I'm seeing them as, as blessings. And I'm thanking God for them. And that opens up new insights. And I journal those too while I'm being thankful for those challenges. And, and it's amazing. It just changes everything. Why is this in my movie is probably the most important question you can ask, I think. You know, it's like akin to why am I here and how can I serve? These are so important. I mean, when you went through and discovered your YOS and it came up as contribute, challenge, trust, how did that feel to you? It felt true. It felt, uh, it felt right. And, you know, I, I don't feel like I... N- I need to do anything with that. It just feels innate. So, yeah, I just uh, I'm I'm grateful for that that um that mission that I've been given to to be uh, a help, you know, and to be in service. Mm. So, last now the last question: If there are people that are listening to this that just resonate with your message, resonate with what you're doing want to connect with you, want to work with you, want to hire you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah. So my personal website is stephanspencer.com and the agency's website is netconcepts.com. They can also get to know me a bit better from my podcasts. I'm uh, particularly passionate about Get Yourself Optimized. That's my personal development, spirituality, biohacking podcast. So they could listen to a few episodes there. Uh, marketing, I still am passionate about that, and that is uh, my other show, Marketing Speak. So that's marketingspeak.com. Get yourself optimized. Get, get yourself optimized.com, or just you know put those keywords into whatever podcast app that you like to use. Mm, awesome, Stefan. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I know it's evening time where you're at, but uh, and your and your son's running around in the background. But thank yeah, you so much for being here. So it's all good. She's here. Okay. Good. Well, I really appreciate this. Learned a ton, and uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode, and that through today's guest you heard how important it is to know your why and how impactful it can be in your life and the lives of those around you. Be sure to head over to whyinstitute.com and discover your why today. Remember, the more you know about yourself, the more you'll know about others. I'm Dr. Gary Sanchez, and I'll see you on the next episode.